Well, good morning, and Happy New Year's Eve. Glad that you are with us this morning. My name is Scott McCullough. I'm one of the elders not on staff here at Zionsville Fellowship, and it's my privilege this morning to bring you a portion of God's Word. Um, If you have your Bibles and you want to turn, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll be looking at a section of uh, verses 19 through 25. So if you want to turn there. Well, this Advent season, we have been in the book of Hebrews, and we have looking, been looking at how Christ, how Jesus has fulfilled the promises of the Old Covenant, and how He has established and brought forth a new covenant, serving as our great high priest. So, several weeks ago, Taylor kicked the series off by showing us how Jesus is the greatest high priest who has ever lived and the only high priest we will ever need because, first of all, he comes from a better order of priest. He comes from the royal priesthood of Melchizedek, and while we don't know much about Melchizedek, we know that he was both a king and a priest. He's also a better high priest because he was installed and put into office as our great high priest directly by an oath from God the Father. And then lastly, Taylor showed us that he's a better high priest because he will never die. He will live forever. And right now he is actually seated at the right hand of God, ever interceding on our behalf. And he is perfect. He has never sinned. And so then in the last three weeks, Drew has shared with us that Jesus has brought a a new and better covenant. And with it, new promises. That first one, the promise of transformation. The promise that God will give us a heart that is actually capable to love and obey and hear God. The promise of relationship. Um, Because of the new covenant and the new way that he has established, everyone can draw close to the Lord and truly know the Lord. And then the third promise was that is forgiveness. And that is because Jesus made atonement for sin once and for all, and therefore we are accepted by God and can boldly approach him in confidence. And then Drew shared with us how Jesus is the true tabernacle, that Jesus is both truly God and truly man. And because God drew near to us through Jesus, we can draw near to him. And then lastly, last week we looked at how Jesus dealt with our greatest problem, our sin. And we saw that by offering himself as the perfect sinless sacrifice, he atoned for sin once and for all. What wonderful realities. So this morning, and I hope that these realities have been the source of joy and wonder and awe as you celebrated Advent and as you celebrated Christmas. For me personally, this has been on the forefront of my mind It's been on my heart, and it has enriched my celebration of Advent this year. And that was our hope, is that you would see that. We would also hope that you would see how Christ fulfilled all those things that we've looked at in Leviticus, which we will return to after this series, or after after the first of the year. And so now, the author of Hebrews has taken great care to expose and remind us of these wonderful gospel realities— And now we come to this short passage in chapter 10, verses 19 through 25, where the author says, because of these gospel realities of Jesus our priest, and because of his ministry as our high priest, live in such a way. And so that's how we will close our Advent series today. And how fitting that we look at this particular passage of how we should live considering Jesus is our great high priest as we look to the promise and the hope of a new year. So... Three exhortations considering the gospel realities presented in Hebrews. First of all, what is an exhortation? An exhortation is a command or an urgent plea to do something or to live in a way that reflects a gospel reality or a truth about God. And so we'll be looking at three in this passage. The first one is draw near to God, which is a call to deeper faith in the gospel. The second one is to hold fast to the confession of your hope, which is a call for us to endure anything that life may bring. 
because of our great hope in the gospel. And then thirdly, we'll consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, which is emphasizing the importance of true gospel community. So these exhortations that we're going to look at here in just a moment are for us individually, but they're also for us as a corporate body of Christ, the church. And so these exhortations also contain, I hope, I think that you may have heard in those three exhortations, they contain the Christian essentials for life of faith, hope, and love. And I hope that becomes clear. And I hope that it's become clear this morning that really one of the main themes of Hebrews is to draw near to the person and the presence of God because Jesus, our great high priest, has made a way. So let's read together. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Actually, I'm going to back up a little bit and start in verse 11, just so that we have a little bit of context going into these verses. Verse 11. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this covenant that I make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins, and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Here's our text for today. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up, one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to be able to draw near to your throne of grace, to enter your presence. So God, I pray this morning by your spirit, by your word, that you would draw us into your presence, that we may see you more clearly, that we may know you more clearly and know your word and be transformed pray that you would speak through me through this time, that you would be with me, and that you would just simply show us Christ and the implications that that has for us. We pray this in his name. Amen. So as I mentioned earlier, I want us to look at how the writer of Hebrews commands us to live, and really not just live individually, but build a gospel community of faith, hope, and love, considering realities of Jesus as our great high priest and his ministry as our great high priest. So there'll be a little bit of redundancy this morning as we look at two of those realities, and then we'll look at those three exhortations or imperatives or commands considering these truths and these realities. So first, we're going to look at two massive realities of Jesus' high priestly ministry, and this is verses 19 through 21. They are the two sense statements that are in our passages. There are two clauses that are intended to cause a desired effect, and that is the execution of these exhortations. The first one, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, verse 19, and two, since Jesus is our great high priest, verse 21, these are reminders of Jesus' high priestly ministry and are the power and the motivation behind the exhortations. Basically, in these two statements, the author is summarizing everything that he has painstakingly written from about mid-chapter 4 till this point. So let's look at them. Verse 19. First reality. 
Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is his flesh. So really what's remarkable about this summary statement that we've observed in this Advent series is that we can confidently and boldly enter the presence of God because we have been, given, been forgiven once and for all by the sacrifice of Christ's body and his blood. And through his death, Christ has opened a new and living way, which is access to the person and presence of God that was not available before. So, and that was not available under the Old Covenant. So we've learned in Leviticus that each year, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would offer sacrifices as sin offerings in preparation to enter the most holy place, which was the, the dwelling place in the presence of God. The purpose of these sacrifices, as we looked at, were to atone for the sins of the priest and the people, but it was also to remind us of our sin, to remind the people of their sin in the Old Covenant, and now to remind us of our sin under the New Covenant. Verse 4 of Hebrews 10 says, But in these sacrifices, referring back to the Old Covenant sacrifices, but in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sin every year. So, This was a reminder of their and our biggest problem. It was their sin, and now our sin, that separates us from God and prevents us from entering His presence. But again, as we've looked at, a weakness of the old covenant was the sacrifices that were offered each year were only temporary and had to be repeated. They never truly satisfied the wrath and the judgment of God to atone for our sin. And also, the high priest was the only one who was able to pass through the curtain into the most holy places where the presence of God was. So, and if this sacrificial process was not followed correctly, God would not accept their sacrifice, and the priest and the people would be judged accordingly. So, living under the old covenant could be a very dangerous and uncertain thing for those people. The success of the priest entering the presence on the Day of Atonement was dependent on his ability to comply and fulfill fulfill and obey the law. And now, the Hebrews reminder is reminding us that that is no longer the truth and the reality for us. The Hebrews author is reminding now that our confidence and our boldness to enter God's presence is because of what Christ has done for us, not by on our ability to obey. Amen. So in verse 10, we see that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ Jesus, uh, through the offering of the body of Christ Jesus once for all. This simple and profound reality is that our confidence and boldness in approaching God is rooted in Jesus' work in our high priest, not in our own ability. So we can draw near to God without being consumed by God's holiness because of the work of Jesus as our great high priest. So that's reality number one. Second reality in verse 21 is since Jesus is our great high priest. And intended this statement is to, again, remind us of how Jesus Jesus' high priest ministry is different and superior to that of the order of the other, the old covenant high priest. So in verse 11, as we read just a moment ago, it says, every priest stands daily to surface, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all a single time, a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. So how is Jesus' high priestly ministry different and superior to that of the older order of high priest? Again, we've looked at that extensively over this series, but I just want to highlight two things real quickly. First of all, Jesus, our, Jesus, our great high priest, actually provided atonement for our sins. And this is because he himself was the perfect sinless sacrifices. The work of the older order of high priests was never effective at removing our sin. And this was our biggest problem. This is what separated us from God and prevented us from drawing near to him. Christ has remedied that. And so, In verse 17, 
the beautiful reality of this statement is that God will remember our sin and our lawless deeds no more. This means that when we stand before God because of the work of Christ, He will not hold our sin against us as an indictment in judgment. So, those are the two realities of Jesus' high priest ministry that the author wants us to know and be our source of confidence and assurance before he says, here are three essential things that we should do to grow and persevere in the gospel. Since we have confidence to enter the presence of God by the blood of Jesus, and since Jesus is our great high priest, I strongly encourage you or command you to do these three things. Number one, these are the three let us statements. So first statement, let us draw near to God. And in the text, verse 22, it says simply, let us draw near. But this is a call to a deeper faith and understanding in the gospel. So let's read the full, um, the full context of this statement. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our, our bodies washed with pure water. So while the author says draw near, we can, we can assume that the complete statement here is to draw near to God. Why is that? Well, if you look at the previous verses, the previous verses are all about accessing the presence of God. So that makes sense. The other thing is that this is one of the main themes of Hebrews, is that drawing near to God. So six times in Hebrews, the, the writer uses this exhortation, draw near. Three of those times, he's explicit in saying draw near to God. One time he says draw near to the throne of grace, and the other two times it's just simply draw near. This is a main theme, a main imperative or exhortation of Hebrews is to draw near to God because of the ministry of Jesus as our high priest. So the author is calling, again, calling attention to the reality we can draw near to God in full assurance of faith without the guilt of sin because Jesus, our high priest, has atoned for our sin and removed our guilt. Now, this drawing near is not a physical act like it was in the Old Covenant. The actual drawing near to God's presence in the Old Covenant was the priest physically moving through the curtain into the holy places where the presence of God was. That's not what we are doing here. We were referring to entering God's presence, but it's not necessarily a physical reality or a physical act. Um, This drawing near is an invisible act of the heart, which is really our inner self, our essence. It's the act of fixating our heart, our mind, our thoughts, our desires on Him. It's drawing to Him in this way, not necessarily in a physical presence. And so what's beautiful about this is that under the Old Covenant, the only way to access the presence of God was for one man, the high priest, one day a year to enter the most holy places. Well, now we can enter the presence of God by drawing near to Him in our hearts, in our minds, anytime, any place. You can do it while you're sitting here in a sermon, sitting here in a pew listening to a sermon. You can do it while you're standing or taking a walk. You can do it while you're laying in a hospital bed. So we can access Him at any time because of the work of Christ. So, What does it mean to draw near to God with a true heart? In essence, what we're saying here, it means drawing near to the person and the presence of God with a genuine commitment to know Him. That's what it means. It means drawing near to the person and the presence of God with a genuine commitment to know Him. So it means increasing a knowledge of who He is and then also experiencing His presence. So, it's both an intellectual and an experiential pursuit of God with a true commitment to know Him. It's about cultivating and pursuing a relationship with God for the purpose of of deepening our faith in Him and His gospel message. So, this is one of those realities that probably has impacted me the most as I've reflected on preparing for this passage and contemplated this text I'm just struck that our Creator, God of the universe, the triune God, actually desires to have a relationship with you and me. 
the most powerful, influential being, the most powerful, influential ring, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is inviting us into this ring of fellowship. And not because their fellowship is incomplete, far from it. Their fellowship is perfect. The reason why God is allowing us to draw near to Him is because of what was mentioned earlier in this service, is because He loves us. He loves us, and He wants us to experience what He Himself experiences, the glory and wonder and awe of the Trinity. So, God is the one who made this reality of drawing near to Him possible by first drawing near to us through Jesus. God became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what we celebrate at Advent. We celebrate His first coming. Um, We celebrate all the promises that were fulfilled in Him at His birth as a suffering servant. So, He came and suffered, died on the cross, atoning for our sins once and for all through the tearing of His body and the shedding of His blood. And this is the gospel message. So, the Holy Spirit of God invites us to draw near to God the Father because He first drew near to us through God the Son. And so, one of my exhortations to you this morning is you may not have ever made a public or even an internal personal profession of faith in Jesus Christ. He's inviting you to draw near to the presence of God through Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. Anyone who is trusting in Jesus for the work that He completed as our high priest can approach the throne of God. Tim Keller, um, one of my heroes, and one who we lost this year, says this, to stand in the presence of God, that is what the gospel is. The gospel is not primarily about forgiveness. It's not primarily about good feelings. It's not primarily about power. All those things are byproducts. They are sparks. It is primarily about the presence of God. That's the gospel message that, and the gospel re- reality that um, I want us to know. So how do we draw near to Him? So earlier, I said it's both an intellectual and an experiential pursuit. So the intellectual pursuit comes from knowing His Word. God reveals Himself to us primarily through His Word. In Hebrews 1.1, which we looked at on Christmas Eve, it says long ago and at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, which is the time after Christ's first coming and between His second coming, He has spoken to us by His Son. So what this means is that all that God has spoken to us and all that He wants us to know about who He is, is recorded in Scripture. And so that's why we must prioritize regularly reading, hearing, and studying His Word. Now, the experiential part, or the pursuit of drawing near to God, is about having a deep relationship or friendship with God, which again was made possible through Jesus, our great high priest. Relationally, we draw near to Him just like we would anyone else, by spending time with Him. Time with Him in prayer, meditating on His Word. And we also experience His presence as we did this morning, by coming together and worshiping Him, which worshiping is just valuing and treasuring Him above all things. That's what worship means. So we can do that in the quiet of our homes, in the quiet of our minds, and we can do that corporately together as we boldly sing and proclaim Him. So these are a few of the main ways in which We know and experience God. In a few moments, we can actually see how we may draw nearer, closer to God by drawing closer to each other. So, um, let's look real briefly at why drawing near to God is so essential. Why is this exhortation really, in a sense, arguably the main theme of this text and listed as the first exhortation? So that we know, and Drew Drew mentioned this several weeks ago, and one of the promises of the new covenant is that when we draw near to God in His presence, He transforms us. He changes us. Our transformation and sanctification into the image of Christ occurs when we draw near to God the Father through Jesus, God the Son. 
So what this means is that we can and should exercise these spiritual disciplines of study and prayer and meditation and pursuing a relationship with Him, but we also have to understand it is God who does the work of transformation. It is God. God is the one who changes us when we draw near to His presence. And so when we draw near to God, He changes us. I just want to call out three ways that He changes us. So when we draw near to God, He changes us by, first of all, reordering our lives and our desires. We become less fixed on pursuing our own desires and personal plans, and we become more preoccupied with knowing and experiencing His glory, as was prayed for earlier, that we just become consumed with God and His gospel and knowing Him. Psalm 34, 7 says this, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. When we draw near to Him, or as the psalmist says, when we delight in Him, our desires become His desires. So He reorders our lives. The second thing, when we draw near to God, He changes us by exposing our sin and compelling us to deal with it through confession and through repentance. The more we are drawn to Him, the more we are transformed, and the more acutely aware we become of our sin that is ever before us, and the more compelled we are to deal with it and see His holiness. Psalm 119 says, Psalm 130 says, The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. So our sin and His holiness are exposed. And thirdly, when we draw near to God, He changes us by showing and reminding us that we can be satisfied with Him and with Him only. And this satisfaction comes from knowing, um, from knowing Him actually starts to fuel a deeper desire to know Him and have communion with Him. Psalm 27, 4 says, One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. So I was trying to think of how this works because as you draw to him, draw near to God, your desire is to draw even closer to God. And so the best analogy I can think of is a metal object and a magnet. We being the metal object, God being the magnet. There is a force that is exerted from the magnet to the metal object that attracts the metal object to the magnet. And in the principle of this magnetic theory or this principle is that the closer this metal object gets to the magnet, the stronger the force is exerted on that object. And the faster that object is drawn, it's accelerated to that magnet. That's how it is when we taste and see that the Lord is good. We become hungrier and thirstier for experiencing His presence. And we find that the only thing, the only thing that can quench that is Him. So, Scripture is filled with those who have encountered God, those who drew near to His presence and were forever changed. We have also witnessed transformation in our own lives. I am not the same person that I was 40 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and row three can attest to that over here on my, on my left. Praise God, I'm not the same person I was. That's the power and the reality of the transforming effect of God and His gospel on me. We also see that in friends around us. Hearing and witnessing testimonies of conversion and transformation are so powerful to us because it again convicts us of the reality of God's transforming work and His power. So that's why we have folks come up on stage when they're baptized to share their conversion of faith, to tell us their story of transformation, of coming to know and experience the gospel. As elders, part of the new membership process is we read written testimonies of all those who come forth for membership, and it's one of our most favorite things that we do, is to read those testimonies of God's transforming power on these individuals. It fuels our faith and the knowledge and reality of God. So, Wrapping up the first exhortation, and I promise the next two will be quickly, but this one is truly, truly sort of the central theme here. Through Christ, we have access to God. We can draw near to Him in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience because of the ministry of Jesus, our great high priest. And so when we draw near to God, 
our faith in him and the gospel deepens. His glory and our perception of him become more clear and we are transformed. Exhortation two, second command here. Hold fast to the confession of our hope. So verse 23 is a call to endure anything because of our great hope in the gospel. Hebrews 10, 23 says this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So all of scripture, but particularly Hebrews, was written for people who were struggling. So it's good medicine for the weary, for the anxious. The original audience, I think as Drew has mentioned a few weeks ago, were suffering significant persecution because of their conversion from Judaism to Christianity. They also lived under, most likely, the brutal and oppressive Roman Empire. And some of, some of the folks were just simply neglecting their faith altogether. Um, and we see this, we know this because we see this as a glimpse in Hebrews 10, 32 through 36, the writer says, But recall the former days. After you were enlightened, that is, that is when you received the gospel, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that yours, you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding hope. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So, we may not be able to relate to the persecution of converting from Judaism to Christianity. We may not be able to relate to live under an oppressive brutal government, although some could probably argue that today. Um, we don't. But we can most certainly relate to the people, the original audience of this letter, and the fact that we struggle. We struggle because life gets hard, and the circumstances of life diminish our joy in God and His gospel. We fade. We shrink back, as the text says. We also are a people riddled with anxiety because we have so much uncertainty in our future. I look at 2024, and I can list you a number of things that will keep me up at night if I just simply dwell on those things of just the stage of life that we're in right now. Aging parents, children who are coming into their own faith, all these things that weigh on us can cause us great anxiety and can diminish our joy. And so what can be the antidote for this? Well, the writer says, remembering what we know to be true. That is the confession of our hope. And also the one who promised this hope. So the, the term hope in verse 23, it, it's not used the way we use it. Like, I hope the Cowboys win. No, that's not how hope is used here. Hope is a certainty of what I look forward to and what I know to be true. Okay, it's what is promised and who is making the promises. So, turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. We're going to read verses 1 through 7 together. I'll give you a moment to turn there with me. So, Revelation 21 is our future. This is our hope. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the, former, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. 
And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. So, that is our great hope. Jesus will return. Advent is about celebrating what Christ fulfilled in his first return as a suffering servant, as our great high priest, as our king. But Advent is also about anticipating his second return. And this time he comes as a conquering king to make all things new. And everyone, every power will acknowledge who he is. And so this future and this hope that we just read about in Revelation 21 is for those who conquer. And what that means, it's for those who persevere in faith till the end. That's what it means to conquer. And this hope is our future because God promised it. He said, write these things down, for they are trustworthy and true. So our hope and our joy are rooted in the reality of the gospel. Everlasting life. Basking in the magnificence, worth, loveliness, and grandeur of God's many perfections, our future is a return to Eden because God has promised it. Exhortation 2. The third exhortation or command is to consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Verse 24 says this, And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So this final exhortation is for Christians to live a life of mutual encouragement, for us to lovingly motivate each other and to express love to each other in good works. And there are five really brief aspects of this exhortation that I want to share with you. First of all, the first word here is consider. So what this means is that we have to notice and pay close attention to one another. We have to know each other. The second aspect is that The writer uses the word stir. Some of your translations may say spur, but either way, whether it's stir or spur, these are uh, terms of irritation to lovingly motivate us to love and good works. Um, There was a season in my life where I actually did cowboy things and actually owned a set of spurs. And I owned a set of spurs because I had a horse whom when I would, you know, signal to go, wouldn't go. And so I would put on this set of spurs, and I would signal him to go, and boom, there we went. Okay, it was like having a turbo booster in your engine, essentially. Stirring is sort of the same principle. In chemistry, you would stir a solution. You would agitate it. You would disturb it for the purpose of making it something different. And so these words convey a sense of agitation. Now, they're not calling us to be jerks to one another. Let's make that real clear. They're simply saying that sometimes we have to positively motivate and challenge each other to, to, to love and good works. So let me give you a couple of personal examples. One, I love the elders. There's nine of us. We serve together, and we, we enjoy being with one another, uh, but we don't always see eye to eye. And so I might come home from an elders' meeting, and I have come home from an elders' meeting, not necessarily agreeing with the direction on a decision. And it's probably one of those decisions that's really second tier or third tier, So it's not of first-tier importance. But, you know, sometimes I'll vent my frustrations to Lori. And in this particular case, I was venting my frustrations to Lori. And Lori looked at me and said, hey, Scott, could it be that you just don't like having your authority challenged? (laughs) Spur. Stir. That's what that looks like. And that was for the purpose, because Lori loves me more than anyone else in this room. That was for the purpose of saying, Scott, those men love you. They love the church. They love Jesus above all things. Trust them and expect that they have that in mind when they make decisions that may not necessarily you agree with. The other way this could look is just by going to someone and saying, hey, you have an incredible gifting that the Lord has given you and you are not using it. The church needs you. The kingdom needs you. Use it. So that's what it means to start. Third aspect, love is the intended motivation behind our good works. And without love, all that we do is empty. 1 Corinthians 13 says that. Fourth, 
Well, what are these acts of service? They are acts of, well, what are good works? I'm sorry. The good works are acts of service to the church body that build one another up, and they're also acts of service that fulfill personal needs. So it means looking out for one another, taking care of each other. I mean, this is a good thing, but sometimes I feel like it's easier to get Taylor Swift tickets than it is to get on a meal train at ZF. I mean, if you've ever tried that and you're like, I want to get on a meal train, I want to bless this person, oh, it's full. Praise God. That's a wonderful, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But that's what this good works is. It's taking care of one another. It's also taking care of those who are forgotten or overlooked in our communities. So that's what good works is. And then the fifth aspect is to not forsake meeting together. So we're not meant to live life alone. We are made to experience fellowship. And we are made to experience uh, fellowship in the model of the triune God, to be with one another and to enjoy one another. So growing in faith and holding steadfast in our great hope are things we don't do alone. They're things we do together. So we need the truth of the gospel, but we also need community. We need both those things. Okay? So the truth of God's word helps us to value community, and community helps us to grow in faith and hope. So we need both of these. So I must have admit, I've thought of this phrase often as a way to guilt people into not missing church, but that's really not what this particular statement is about. This language is really more about having real community. And sure, part of attending worship together is part of that community, but it's more than that. It is about being known by others, and it is about knowing each other for the purpose of encouraging one another and sharing the gospel so that we may all enjoy God's presence together. So as we close this morning, let me share a few exhortations of my own. Um, First of all, this is really a question for reflection as we look back on 23 and we look forward to 24. The first thing I ask you to reflect on is that anything, even good things, grandbabies, um, anything, even good things that compete for our chief affection and desire, which is to know and draw near to the presence of God, needs to be dealt with. So the questions we really must ask ourselves, what am I truly yearning for? What do I desire above all? What is my ultimate pursuit? So that first exhortation is to consider those three questions. What am I yearning for? What do I desire above all? And what is my ultimate pursuit? The second exhortation for you is to prioritize daily reading, hearing, studying of God's Word. It is our source of faith and hope, and we need daily reminders of His promises. Do not neglect this vital, life-giving spiritual discipline. So if you're not in the habit of doing this daily, let me encourage you, start today. And let me give you a few simple ways to start. The first one is what Edgar mentioned to us at the beginning of the service. Just jump right into the reading plan. And if you miss a day, get back into it the next day. And when you get to Leviticus and Numbers, keep going. Don't stop. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is a book that's been precious to me over these last couple of years. You notice that I used the Psalms earlier today because the Psalms are such a sweet portion of Scripture that really help us draw near to the presence of God and knowing Him. And so there's one particular devotional book that I have. There's a lot of great devotional books out there, but this is one that's, that's been special to me. It's called, In the Lord I Take Refuge, 150 Daily Devotions Through the Psalms by Dane Ortland. I don't think we have it in the resource corner, but I'll put it in the weekly uh, communication. You can order it on Amazon, and maybe we'll start stocking it back there in the resource corner. But that is one where I can read one to three pages a day of a psalm and then hear... Um, and then read commentary on that. So it's a simple, it's a simple focused way to get into God's Word. The third thing is if you're a podcast person, Lori turned me on to this one this year, my wife, is Solid Joy's Daily Devotional from Desiring God and John Piper. It is a three to five minute podcast that John Piper writes and reads daily, and it is wonderful. So you can find that wherever you get your podcast. So those are three things that may help you. But, but through His Word, that is how we know and how we draw close to Him. So spending time in God's Word for the purpose of knowing Him is how we experience true transformation and true satisfaction. Thirdly, prioritize community and true fellowships. Join a small group. 
Pursue friendships with other believers, or at least, at a minimum, linger longer after the service. Now, for all those who are watching today live stream, we're glad you're here. But if you can, we want you here. We want you to be here with us, fellowshipping together and worshiping together in person. Also, if you are here and it's your habit to sit through worship and then make a beeline to your car, stay a little longer. Get to know someone. We need friendship. We need community along with truth. And so lastly, if you have not trusted in Christ, this is my last exhortation, if you've not trusted in Christ for salvation, that is the forgiveness of sin and the hope of eternal life, you can do that today. So if the Spirit of God is stirring you to trust and profess faith in Christ for salvation, do not ignore it. Share the stirring that's in your heart with a trusted friend. Share with me. I'll be down here at the front after the service is over for a few minutes. But don't ignore it. Um, so, to close, two realities. Since we have confidence and assurance to enter the presence of God by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way He opened for us, let us draw near to God, let us hold fast the confession of our hope, and let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, because the day of His return is drawing near. Amen. So let's, let's sing together.